Hey guys, it's John back with another anti-guru video. And this one today comes as part of a request. It comes as a request from our anti-guru channel. Uh, they wanted to know about tandem development, how to get houses behind houses. Now I'm using Zoom for this one today because I'm gonna be sharing my screen and it is well worth a watch, I think. Join me in a few minutes. I'm gonna tell you how to get tandem development to work, backland development, houses behind houses, only on the anti-guru here on YouTube. So tandem development then, or what we call backland development, houses behind houses, however you want to string it. That's been around with us for a long, long, long time. I mean, properly long time. Tandem development has been with us for a while. And the reason why it's been with us is that from the Victorian period, we have been left with very large plots. Now, for tandem, you could always call this plot intensification. That's exactly what it is. But we've always been left from the Victorian period with very large housing plots, large, expansive gardens to the rear that could take something else with the right approach. Now, the government used to hate tandem development. Way back when I first started being a planner, planning policy statement three, planning policy guidance three on housing, said that it was unwise, essentially, to try and put houses behind houses. From that, from that, we have documents like the National Planning Policy Framework, which in its first iteration said the same thing. Garden land was not previously developed land, and therefore, you know, who uh, were we to be trying to force another house back there? But then we had the NPPF, the latest iteration, the 2019, which actually changed the tone and said, well, you know what? It's a source of housing land. Let's use it. Let's try and make something fit. All right. Well, let's have a look at it. So different councils have taken that. And the paragraph actually says it is for a council to set its own policy or not. Different councils have taken that with different strengths of a control. Some councils love backland development. Some councils really get on with it well. I've had great results with like Spellthorn and Croydon where backland development works really, really well. Some councils, South Northamptonshire, Cherwell, hate it. And they hate it with a vicious passion. Now what you have to do, essentially when you're entering into this, is understand the personality of the planning authority. Who is the planning authority and what are they going to likely say? Now, any council that wants to control backland development has to have a policy, it has to have a policy on backland development and it has to have rules that govern how those applications are worded. All right. Now that's really quite important because those policies are there to govern how things happen. They are the rules of the system, the rules of the right. Once we've learned those policies, once we can see how they work in practice, we can see how the council is going to react to backland development in any given state. Now I'm going to give you some ground rules. Normally, Normally, you want backland development to happen where it's already occurred. So normally, you want someone else to have started the pattern for you. The C in victory stands for compare, and you want to be able to compare your development against another development. It's really quite critical to get this right. If you're the first, then there are some really stringent rules on how to make things work but fundamentally let's try not to be the first let's try and compare and contrast so what we're we looking for 
well, in a minute, I'm going to share my screen, nip into Google. I'm going to show you some examples of backland development and what we are looking for. So let's go and do that. So this is my hometown. This is Gosport in Hampshire. In all its infinite glory, uh, levels of sarcasm being applied. But, and but, we do have backland development that's going on here. We do have houses being built behind houses. We just need to look for them. And one of the really good examples of backland that I know of, that I'm really pleased to say that I was involved in, is this one here, Elson Road. And you see there is a area of development going on here. These are actually flats. This is a row of shops. This used to be the car park for this pub. And this is a row of flats. Now these have all been built now. They're all done. And the beauty is with Google, we can go into 3D and we can have a quick nosy at what's being built. But there you go. You can see what's going on here. Yes, there is a close separation distance, but it's not that close. Yes, the pub is losing all of its car park, but in reality, it is just a local boozer in the car park can go. So putting a block of flats back here, not facing anyone's private garden, this window you can see here actually looks over this garage roof, same here. These are all looking over this parking court. These windows facing into the car parking here actually does everything backland should be doing. It's not putting uh, windows, it's not putting mass where mass or windows shouldn't exist. So that's a, a good example, I think at least, of how backland can really work very well. Let's see if we can't find another one. Okay, so again, we're staying in Gosport and we've moved across to Goodwood Road. And, and here we have another example of of good quality backland development that has been developed and it's and it's looking quite nice. Now the trick here of course is that you would have had this pattern of 1930s semi-detached houses. 1930s semis and then they break down into little bungalows along here. So punching a gap in here involves the loss of a pair of bungalows. It actually involves the loss of one bungalow on one, one side to create enough roadway width to get ourselves in. Then we can see how the gardens have been hacked out. These bungalows have got very long gardens. That's the original pattern, as do these houses. And you can see, if I go into plan form, how those gardens have then been truncated. There, there, there in order to carve out an area of land for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's another one there, eight houses. Now the trick with this, and it's not really a trick, it's just good planning, is getting the road to work. Eight houses means a proper road, adoptable standard, turning head, car parking, that all works in practice. Right, and that's the important thing. Amenity space for the proposed houses is also, also mission critical. You've got nice garden sizes here that work in practice. And then we look at how um, that's affected these properties. Well, bungalow to bungalow, that's not going to cause a light outlook privacy issue. So that's quite good. And in reality, these bungalows are going to be left with decent sized gardens. There we are, 10 meters, that's bang on the gospel standard, abiding by policy. So in reality, this backland development scheme is a very good scheme. It works well with its surroundings and tries to fit everything it needs into the application site. Now, my final example of backland, I've actually come to an area of historic relevance. This is Crescent Road. One of the finest examples of Georgian Crescent building in the town. Most, if not all, of these properties are listed and have their own conservation area. And here we see another example of backland development. This is the solo plot style of development. So the other ones I've shown you thus far have been much bigger plots. Here we're looking at solo plot. And here, 
a road is provided for us. Anglesey Arms Road provides an access road, so we don't need to punch a new road in. Now on this string here, we see a whole host of what were former coach houses. Now these were essentially the stable blocks, the garages, the coach houses for the large villa style properties that you have on Crescent Road. And if we drop our man, you'll be able to see what's happened to them. And lo and behold, pretty much with some exceptions, all now housing, even down to some brand spanking new examples. And this is a really good uh, example of backland development utilizing the facility of the application site. This is utilizing an old coach house like this or like this, or where was the one that wasn't done? This one here, like this, and saying, look, what can we do with this brick built building? What can we do with the mass? What can we do with the location? How do we make it work? And this is really positive planning from the borough council to say, okay, we'll go with this. This is part of the historic vernacular, part of the historic grain. Now it does draw a question as to what happens then with the gaps. And the answer is more of the same. The C in victory is compare or copy, and that's exactly what you would be encouraged to do. You would be encouraged to copy this lovely uh, coach house style and carry it across in order to create backland or tandem development that works inside this string, which has already been set out for you. Now, I guess what you're saying right now, back at the computer screen, is, but John, I haven't got an existing string, so how do I start it? I haven't got anything that can help me here, so how do I start building out backland development from a planning perspective? And let me find you an example in Gospel where it meets all of the criteria. Okay, so what we're looking at for plot intensification is this kind of 1950s to 1980s cul-de-sac style area. The reason why we're looking for this is we're looking for a lot of inefficiency. We're looking for areas which can be accumulated to create one plot or two plots out of people's gardens in order to start a pattern. Now, we're certainly not going to start that pattern. We're certainly not going to start that pattern in the middle of a terrace block because we don't have any access to it. We can't take, for example, the garden of this property here and go, mm, yes, let's whack a house in the back of that. That's not going to work. But what we can do is look at some of these cul-de-sacs down here and look at them in a more productive way. So let's just take that as it sits. So here we've got this terrace of properties, this semi-detached pair, 1950s to 1980s, estate built, lots of space, lots of uh, room to maneuver in and around. And let's just have a look at this property or this pair of properties here. So the first thing you have to ask yourself is how many gardens do I need to assemble in order to get to a house plot? So we're looking at these house plots here and we're saying, well, actually the house plots are point to point 26 meters deep. So I need 26 meters worth of garden. That's why starting at an edge works really, really well. So we're gonna start at the edge here and we're gonna cut ourselves in and we're gonna find out that about 26 meters takes us three gardens width. Fine, no problem there. Now. We're going to look at the local policy, and I know in Gosport that houses need 10 metre gardens or thereabouts. So I'm going to plot on a 10 metre garden here. Now that's going to take me about there. So this house, this house, and this house will have a preserved 10 metre garden. That's important for me because I need to be able to comply with policy. So what does that leave? Well, this plot effectively is like that, that, that. And that, right, just drawn it on. Now the next question you need to be asking yourself 
is does that look right? If it looks right, it is right. Okay, so does that look right? Yes, I'm taking over some of this, this driveway that would previously have served these houses here. Yes, I'm taking some of this boat storage space. That's highly amusing. But it, does it look broadly correct? I could probably cut this plot down a bit in length so it didn't interfere too much with this roadway. That would be fine. Now, what can I get on that? The answer is a single house because I know I can see I've got width here and I've got width here. So I've cut myself out a plot where one didn't exist for one house out of three effectively uh, gardens and a bit of road. That's how you start it. What you're doing is you're looking at what you would have to do to take one of these houses and put on to someone's garden. So take one of these houses and move it across equally or take one of these houses and move it across. Two story in two story relationships, two story in two story areas, single story in single story areas. Uh, if the council seek to knock you down by half a story, that's absolutely fine. They're allowed to do so. Okay guys, I hope that's helped. Like, comment, subscribe. It did come as a result of a request on the Antiguru channel. So do like, comment, subscribe, comment if you want to see any further videos. The next one I'm doing is on uh, micro flats and the difference between micro flats and HMOs. That's all going to be very interesting. But otherwise, have a great day and I'll see you on the next Antiguru.